On Hireside Chats, we explore the world's deepest conspiracies, its mysteries, and the all-around fringe on a quest that can't be sponsored by anyone but the loyal listeners looking to take that ride. So if you enjoy the first hour of the show, courtesy of those subscribers, we hope that you'll consider becoming one for just $5 a month, and you'll get a second hour of each THC episode, where we pack in twice as much interesting content with all our great guests. Just sign up on our members' website at thehiresidechatsplus.com, and you'll have instant access to all the extended content since Plus began, an opportunity to make topics and guest suggestions, and your own custom RSS feed, where you'll hear the full two-hour show in one convenient, uninterrupted file. And most importantly, you won't hear this repetitive reminder at the start of every show that listener-supported communities are the future of media and entertainment. And you want to be part of that future, don't you? In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. But we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Here we go, Ironside Chatters. Welcome to the show. Drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke, and having a heck of a Valentine's Day in sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood, and we are taking back this Hallmark holiday today in a big way. This is probably an episode some of our networks might skip, a show you might not want to share with the whole family, not one for the kids. It's not overly vulgar or anything, but we're talking about sex for two hours. So if you're easily offended, why even try? For the rest of us, I think this is a pretty fun topic, and when New Page sent over Jason's book, V-Day Special was my first thought, and here we are. The thought has been manifested. <laughs> the only other thing I would mention is that we started on Skype, and then after two questions, moved over to the landline phone, because we had some odd connection problems. It was cutting out in a weird way at key moments, so instead of just dealing with it, I thought it'd be better to make the change pretty early on. I want to let you know that that happens. And from there, it's pretty smooth sailing. So let's dive into it. I know a lot of people have emailed me being like, when is that sex magic show coming out? So here it comes. Sex magic, tantric sorcery, her monkey lie, and more with Jason Miller. Enjoy. Some of them want to use you. Some of them want to get used by you. Some of them want to abuse you. Some of them want to be abused. All right, people, it has been a long journey for us at THC, and of all the vast subjects we dive into, one of the most intriguing for me is magic. And at this point, we've talked with many magic practitioners and a whole host of different schools and techniques and themes. And today we're going to get back to the magical OG at THC. Today's guest, Jason Miller, was my guest over two years ago on only our 31st episode talking about financial sorcery. And now he's back to shed some light on magic for the lovers. Jason's new book is called Sex, Sorcery, and Spirit, The Secrets of Esoteric Magic. And he's just the guy to write it. Jason's been peeking behind the veil since his early teens, studying with ceremonial magicians, root workers, witches, tantric llamas, and more, all before hitting the legal drinking age. Eventually, Jason's magical pursuit brought him to a stint in the OTO and a journey to Nepal where he took things up a notch and found a way to incorporate the best of the best from several traditions, both East and West, and developed a style all his own that I'm psyched to talk more about today. Jason, my man, welcome back to THC. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be back. Yeah, man, this is great. Thanks for doing it. Uh, I think it's going to be a blast. You were my first guest on Magic. I knew almost nothing at the time. I feel way more equipped to have that conversation now. But um, let me have you reintroduce your philosophy and approach to Magic and Sorcery in general for the people, because everybody's different, and I find it's a, a good way to understand where someone is coming from right out of the gate. All right, so my philosophy of magic is pretty purely pragmatic. Whether you are talking about spiritual evolution or effects in the outer world, like finances for my last book, I'm about getting things done, about making changes, stuff that you do, not stuff that you believe, not stuff that 
has no effect on you personally as far as you know what you think the emanations of reality are or, or something like this so i i choose the term sorcerer because it is it implies someone who is doing something not uh, on a purely mystical level mm-hmm. and uh my philosophy also strongly incorporates the magical and the mundane together, uh, much more so uh, integrated closer than in any other system that I'm aware of. So while lots of magical systems will say, well, you know, here's a spell for getting a job, and then you should go out and look for a job, my magical system is based upon doing a spell to find a job, then doing a spell for each step of finding a job, and then also putting as much thought and effort into how you're doing that as you do the magical end. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's why in my last book, Financial Sorcery, I went on and on about how to put together resumes and how to uh, (laughs) manage money and so on, more, more even than the magical end. And so in this new book on sex magic, it's the same thing. There's a lot of technical expertise for the sex act married with energetic and and spiritual functions of it. I know you've gone through a lot of traditional schools, but I guess, would you consider yourself now somewhat of a chaos magician? No, um, there's, there's several differences between chaos magic and what I do. You know, in a way, it's a shame because ever since the advent of chaos magic, people have tended to look at anyone that combines multiple systems or or is involved in multiple systems as chaos magicians, but people have been doing this for thousands of years. You know, you Mm -hmm. can't go back and call the... uh, the people that wrote the Greek magical papyri, chaos magicians. <laughs> so, or for that matter, the, the people that put together Tibetan Buddhism in the 8th century, you know, they're, they're not chaos magicians. They're people that interfaced with multiple systems. Because when you're doing magic, it's not about belief. It's not about adhering to one tradition. It's about the reality that's right in front of you. So a magician should have no more trouble putting together, say, you know, elements of Tibetan magic and, say, Western magic or Greek magic than one would going to New York City, hopping into a cab driven by a Greek driver and having him drop you off at a Tibetan restaurant. It's all, it's all there. It's all right in front of you. So the aspects of chaos magic that I appreciate are the aspects that streamline the processes to not get caught up in a bunch of Baroque ritualism, but the aspects that I reject have to do with not really giving any reality to any spirit beyond the mind. So whereas a chaos magician might feel perfectly comfortable invoking Scrooge McDuck (laughs) for money, I think that's a little silly, and I, I find a definite difference between Scrooge McDuck and, say, Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the chaos magician would say that, you know, more people, quote, believe in Superman than in Helios in today's world, I would say that's not true. No one believes in Superman. They pay attention to Superman. Gotcha. So... Belief itself is also less of a function in my world than it is in chaos magic. Most of the magic that I do does not require belief as a prerequisite. Fair point. And I like the idea of characters getting big enough to create an archetype or a mimetic entity. But I understand that incorporating that into a serious practice. I guess it just sort of depends on how the individual views the mechanics of magic as to if those type of workings would have any merit or not. But... I appreciate you laying out some of your ideas on magic and sorcery. It's an important first step in a conversation about something that can be very individualized. And I also have to apologize to those listening because I know the microphone Jason is using sounds good, but we're having some weird distortion problems, probably due to the connection somehow. So we're going to pick this up on the landline, and I think we're going to have a lot more consistency without those weird drops. 
And that said, I really do want to get into the topic at hand of sex magic, but I just got to ask you first about studying in the Himalayas. I mean, obviously a guy from New Jersey making the pilgrimage to the exotic lands of Nepal on a quest for magical knowledge sounds very sexy, very provocative, and fairly unique. So I got to ask you to tell us a little bit about that. What was that adventure like, man? Uh, it was amazing. It was, uh, it was amazing, but, but far from unique. In fact, I remember one moment, um, walking away from Triton Norbutse, which is a big bumpo monastery outside of Swayambunath. And I was walking with my teacher, uh, Lama Vajranatha, whose name is John, real name is John Reynolds. Uh, and he is also from New Jersey. I met him uh, when I was still a teenager. And we were walking with uh, a, a guy that's an explorer in Tibet, John Beliza, and he is also from New Jersey. So <laughs> we, we're, we're, we were like three generations <laughs> of Jersey guys walking uh, through Nepal near this Bumpo monastery. It was, it was pretty wild, but it was fantastic. Uh, I had someone who was able to unlock a lot of doors for me before I went over there, and uh, as well as connections I had made myself in the preceding years. So once I hit Kathmandu, a, a lot of doors started opening. I moved uh, out to the foothills and lived with the famous Nakba, which is like a Tibetan sorcerer, non-monastic, you know, tantric sorcerer. Uh, and I lived with Kunzang Dorje for a month, and uh, then came back to the city and, and did other studies. And, you know, it was, <laughs> I, 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 when I was young, I was a little bit of a comic book geek. <laughs> and uh, all, all the great mystical superheroes, they, they get their powers from Tibet. Exactly. You know, Man, Mandrake the Magician, Tibet. The Shadow, Tibet. Dr. Strange, Tibet. Even Dr. Doom, Tibet. Yeah. Um, so I just figured, hey, you know, if I'm going to, you know, I've, I've taken the Western tradition as far as, as I can take it right now, and I feel like I'm being pulled in this direction, I should go as close to Tibet as I can. And of course, nowadays, most of the Tibetans that are actually able to teach are not in Tibet, they're in Nepal or in India. So that was the place to go. Right on. That's very cool. Uh, so let's get into it. Erotic alchemy and sex magic. People might come into this thinking all sorts of things, having a bunch of preconceived notions about it or what it might be. So how would you define and introduce this to somebody who isn't familiar with this slice of the sorcery pie? Well, the first thing that I would say is that we want to separate it out from love magic. So this is not magic to get a lover. It is not magic to get laid. That is a different kind of thing. So in other words, if you're casting spells or summoning spirits in order to find romance or, or to, you know, find someone to have sex with, that's a whole other ball of wax. Nothing wrong with that. Might, you know, I've, I've done that myself. Might write about it in the future. But not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is the use of sex as a tool in magic. So the magic could be aimed at anything. It could be aimed at spiritual evolution. It could be aimed at finding a job. It could be aimed at getting even with your neighbors. <laughs> um, whatever. Sex is the tool. And the idea here is that sex is just a powerful, potent, and primordial thing. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it on, on all the different levels, it makes total sense. First of all, on the physical level, sex is what creates people. So it is an act of creation. So if you think of your intended result as a quote-unquote magical child – then it totally makes sense that if you divert the energies of sex towards this goal, then you're able to manifest it. Uh, on the energetic level, I think even, even people that are not occultists, not uh, magicians, not even New Agers or, 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 or yogis or, um, 
or yoga practitioners or, or martial artists, other people who get used to sort of feeling and projecting energy. Mm-hmm. I think even if you're not one of those people, you feel the energies of the body during sex. Right. You know, people can feel the energy move in their body. They can feel it in their head. They can feel it in their, you know, in their, uh, their sexy parts. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they can feel it sort of gather and move and, and flow. So there is this intense amount of energy that you're working with. And then there is this huge mental thing. First of all, sex itself is a primordial drive, so the, ener- the, the mental energy that accompanies sex is hugely uh, powerful, but also that moment of orgasm that explodes the ego, which is why the, the French call it le petit mort, the little death, is because the mind just shatters at that moment, and it opens this gateway into this other state. You know, the whole idea of Tantric Buddhism is that Buddhahood is not that far away, that you can explore it and reach it not only through sort of the ordinary means of, uh, you know, renunciation and slowly, slowly building your way there, but you can sort of blast your way there or alchemically transform your way there by experiencing these states that are close to it. And one of those states and one of the most easily accessed of those states is the sex act, is the moment of orgasm. Yeah, man, I agree with you. I know for me personally, I am pretty energetically dense. I don't seem to feel the same effects from Reiki or locations where people say they feel a high energy or from being around crystals or any of those types of things. But when people start talking about the kundalini or the chakras or energy systems in the body, again, it's not something I felt much in my life, with the exception, of course, of the orgasm. And then that's what really makes it more interesting because we don't really consider the feeling of the orgasm that much. We take it for granted, but it is weird and it's very, very powerful. There's nothing else like it, at least not in sober reality that I know of. And you could interpret that as a clue from the universe that there's more out there. Or you could say it's like the lowest hanging fruit on a vast tree of energetic possibilities. And no one really ever goes above that lowest rung. So it probably is worth being curious about and exploring the deeper possibilities of, as well as occasionally having a conscious intention for that energy transfer. It does make sense to me. There you go. And spiritually speaking, it's, it's very appropriate for those of us that are, are not monks, you know, one of the stories I tell at the beginning of the book is the, the origin of the Guya Samaja Tantra. Um, and in this, King Indrabhuti uh, sees uh, birds flying north into the Himalayas every night and south down into India every morning. And he asks his ministers what's going on, and uh, they say, oh, that's not birds at all, that's the Buddha, and he's flying north into the Himalayas to do secret yogas at night, and then flies back to Varnasi in the morning to, to teach Buddhism. So Indrabhuti invites him um, to the kingdom to teach, and he spends a few days teaching the Buddhism that we all know, of, you know, renouncing sex and drinking and, you know, all the fun stuff and, and, you know, quitting your job and becoming a monk and all that kind of jazz. And finally, the king is like, well, look, you know, this is all well and good, but I'm the king. You know, my wife would be really pissed at me. Um, I've got many children who would be left fatherless. I, I've got a kingdom to run, and, and it would just cause all kinds of strife if I were to suddenly say, you know what, I'm going to become a monk. Is there no other way to achieve enlightenment? And the Buddha smiled and instantly transformed into this glorious, three-headed, six-armed, uh awesome tantric being who had then another tantric being on his lap that he was having sex with. And uh, all the arhats that that accompanied the Buddha fainted straight away, which explains why none of this is in the sutras. Um, (laughs) And uh, he then explained to the king how you can achieve enlightenment through tantric sex. So it's a... um, 
it's a path that is open and effective to those of us that have, you know, worldly commitments that are not, have chosen for whatever reason not to renounce the world. Yeah, I actually, I really like that story. And it does speak to one of the questions I had for you, which is why we see enlightenment so often equated with celibacy among monks and everything. But yet they have this school of of sex magic that I guess is just tucked away and not really talked about. Why is it that we always see celibacy as such a big deal with monks? Well, you know, it's not even that it's not talked about. The sex imagery is very prevalent in Tibetan Buddhism. You can walk into any monastery and see images of the deities having sex. But the idea is that it's not safe. The safe way is the monastic way. The safe way is, you know, to slowly cultivate positive qualities, to slowly get rid of negative qualities, to renounce those negative qualities. This is the safer way. This is the way that is most appropriate to most people, or at least it was back in the day. But there are many writings that indicate that we are no longer in such an era where these things are are the most appropriate. But even today, I would not recommend sex magic as the path to everyone or even to most people out there, but that's no reason to keep it utterly hidden and, and, and secret. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Now, there are some things you talk about sexual yoga in the book and Himalayan Tantra. Is there a difference between these two things? Well, you know, sexual yoga, yoga is just means really practices. You know, you can go to uh, an ashram or a dharma center and they'll give you karma yoga uh, they say, you know, do some karma yoga. What they're telling you is clean up the shrine room. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, everything is a yoga. Um, not just hatha yoga of, of bending yourself into, uh, you know, cool asanas and stuff like that. So yoga is sort of a, a general term for practices originating in India and and uh, and also the Himalayas. The ta- and you know tantric Buddhism, tantric sex practices are a yoga. You know, Kama Mudra yoga uh, would fall under that. But these you know sex practices are not limited to to this region by any sense. There's lots of uh, Taoist sex magic. And, of course, we have sex magic in the Western tradition. More recently, we have the traditions originated by uh, Pascal Beverly Randolph and carried on by Aleister Crowley and and so on. Uh, But we also have hints of sex magic practice uh, or or sexual spirituality in early Christianity with the sacrament of the bridal chamber and, and so on. But we, you know, a lot of that has been lost to uh, histories and persecution and, and purging of historical records. So. so true, so true. And that damage applies to so many things. But one, one thing you did talk about in the book from a historical context within religions is the idea of having sex with gods. Of course, it's huge in Greek mythology and Egyptian mythology and even Christianity, not only with the Nephilim, but also the story of Jesus. You have Mary being impregnated by God. I find that interesting that so many religions have that theme of sex with the gods or non-human entities. And today, I think a lot of people would probably find that to be crazy or impossible, but that might just be a product of our current culture, to think that it's not possible. But there are some reasons to think that it might be, right? Well, you know, I mean, it it is certainly within the realm of possibility if you believe in these things. It is also, I, I am sure, you know, that many an unwanted pregnancy or, uh, you know, child born by rape or something like that was sort of, you know, in, in old days reported as an immaculate conception of, of some kind or another. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there are multitudes of, of, of ways that this happened. So, for instance, in the, in the medieval Christian tradition, 
uh, you have a lot of writings about incubuses and succubuses, demons that come and steal the sexual essence. Uh, the incubus, of course, meaning laying on top. So it's the uh, male demon that, that mounts females in their sleep. Uh, and then the uh, succubus, meaning laying underneath the female demon who uh, takes male nightly emissions. It's the explanation for uh, wet dreams. Mm. Really. And then you have, uh, but a lot of modern day examples, you know, I talk about this woman in Iceland who allegedly has sex with elves and uh, Ida Craddock who uh, lived in Philadelphia and wrote extensively about heavenly bridegrooms, how to take an angel as a lover and, and how this itself was a type of uh, a, a holy practice, a yoga, if you will, that having sex with this being that is, you know, in nature close to God brings you by proxy closer to God. Yeah. Ida was an interesting one. I guess she's, she felt like she was married to an angel named Soph or something like something close to that. Uh, yep. Wow. I guess she felt like she had enough sustained contact with this being to actually commit to them in a uh, physical relationship. That's pretty wild. Yeah. 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 <laughs> a lot of, a lot of good books about Ida Craddock lately. And, uh, I, I think, you know, folks in the OTO and the Philemic community in general, uh, deserve a lot of credit because while she was not particularly, you know, I don't even know if she was even aware of Alistair Crowley at all, but her writings have been mostly brought to light through the efforts of people in that community. And of of course, Crowley wrote very positively about her work. So kudos to them for, uh, you know, they sometimes get accused, and, and rightly so, of being a little too stuck on the writings of Crowley. But at least they have gone so far as to shed more light on Randolph and on uh, Craddock in recent years. So, right on. Uh, you know, one step removed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about the OTO a little bit. You you have had firsthand experience. You've been with them for a little while. I guess in the book you say that you were kind of you were kind of frustrated with the progression, with the time length of the progression throughout it. But what can you tell us about the OTO and your experience with them as it pertains to to sex in the magical practice? Well, you know, I. I would have to say that, I mean, the, the, sure, I mean, the timeline of how one progresses from Minerval to Ninth Degree was a matter of frustration. And that was not my main reason for, for departing. But I left on good terms, and I think of them fondly and recommend them to people that are interested in that uh, and have nothing but a, you know, a positive experience. That said, uh, the OTO nowadays has largely forgotten its original mission of spreading sex magic teachings in favor of, of spreading the law of Philemon. Mm -hmm. So it is much more a, a vehicle for the philosophy slash religion, really, stemming from Aleister Crowley. So that I'm not particularly interested in. So I eventually got a lot of the teachings uh, that the OTO gives through a secondary order called the Chthonic Oranian. And overall, the, the sex magic teachings of Aleister Crowley are interesting. But in my opinion, they lack a key element that I found in, in the East, and that is the element of inner heat. Western sex magic looks at alchemy for how they believe sex magic to work. And, and rightly so. And so they look at the act of sex as the heating, as the sublimation of uh, the elixir or, or, or the element, you know, the gross element, which will produce the elixir. And mm -hmm. I think they're right about that as well. But in practice, they interpret this heating as simply having sex for a long time. You know, one of the people to spell this out very, very plainly for the West was uh, Don Michael Craig in his uh, Modern Magic and then later in his book about sex magic. 
And he, he speaks about it almost purely in terms of length. You're having sex for a minimum of 20 to 40 minutes. And that this is what, what is the heating process. But that's not the case in the East. The case in the East is that very specific movement of energy and breath creates the heat. And then you bring that into the sexual area. So that's the element that's sort of missing. And then uh, the other thing about Crowley is that a lot of the sexual teachings are masked in alchemical terms and hidden away as was needed during the Victorian age, you know, but we are not in the Victorian age. The, you know, you can talk plainly about these things mm-hmm. uh, nowadays and not have ladies collapsing into piles of crinoline at the shock. <laughs> uh, you know, we live in the era of two girls, one cup. There is nothing in sex magic that is shocking <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Uh, well said. So it's uh, the time for like giggling and discussing these encoded terms. It, it's just silly. I mean, it, it's it's yet people still do it in, in some of these communities. Act like this is some really big titillating deal when you know it. it sixth graders are discussing things with more frank and frankness and candor. <laughs> <laughs> so. Let's maybe mention a couple of sexual sorcery 101 things uh, before we kind of get into maybe some actual ideas for the practice. For example, I guess something people might not realize is that a big part of this is realizing that the orgasm and the ejaculation are two separate processes for the male. They come really close together. But it's a fundamental thing to realize that that length of time between the two can be greatly expanded and played with to really understand what kind of things people are doing, right? Exactly, exactly. And this is, um, you know, this goes into what I was saying before about that moment of orgasm. You know, that moment of orgasm is that that magical, mind-splitting, ego-shattering moment. And so if you can extend that, if you can make, make it effects deeper and to last longer, then you've really come on to something. And so recognizing that you can have an orgasm without physical ejaculation is one of the keys to retaining energy, what the Chinese called jing, your generative energy. Uh, they believed that you don't get any more generative energy throughout your life, that you only have a certain amount. So, you know, we, we have these practices whereby we have the orgasm, but we reverse the flow of the fluid and the energy. Rather than this down, having everything flow down and out, we can reverse it to go upward and inward. This is a little bit like the best description is <clears throat> plugging your, your, your groin into your brain <laughs> directly. Yeah. You're taking your lower centers and your upper centers that are normally connected through your, your shushumna and, and, and through the, the levels of, of the chakras and so on. And you're basically just connecting a direct line. <laughs> And uh, bam, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, experience and, and, and even more sexually gratifying than the normal release of orgasm. And of course, this feeds into why uh, there's so much sex instruction for men is be, not only because of the patriarchy, which is the, probably the biggest reason, but because men lose our fluid at orgasm and women don't. Um, we tend to feel physically exhausted after orgasm, and women don't. Mm-hmm. We are generally not predisposed towards multiple orgasms unless we are able to control ourselves well. Women are. So uh, we need the help. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Yeah, man. So this is, uh, yeah, that's that spot on. That that window between that the two can be uh, can be played with in very specific ways. Mm-hmm. Man, it's, of course, you know, sex and magic, even separately, are two of the biggest taboos our society has had throughout history. But you can't deny, in modern times, you'd be a fool to deny you don't like an orgasm. And the how could the idea of lengthening that or gaining more control over that, how could that not be intriguing to someone? You know, life is about experience and about pleasure. And I, I think that, you know, you're lying to yourself if someone were to say they aren't intrigued by that. Although it does seem like daunting work, I will say. It is. It is daunting work. It, it it is, and that's the thing about this book is that it presents the challenge of something that you're going to have to do exercises for. A lot of the things in this book, the things that are the most important in this book, are things that you will have to train to do. That that you will have to, you know, when you're going to the bathroom, you're going to have to stop and start your urine. <laughs> just and, and exercise that muscle to be able to control it. You're going to have to get used to breathing in a different way while still being active. So this is probably going to be one of my, uh, you know, I hope not, but, but one of my least popular books <laughs> in the end, uh, although it's well-reviewed because it presents something that most people are just not going to put the time and effort into. <laughs> um, and especially nowadays, when, when men are losing interest in sex even, uh, even just ordinary sex, in favor of, you know, watching porn, the, mm-hmm. the easy accessibility of porn. So to, to give them the challenge not only of getting laid, but of actually... Um, having to uh do all this work it just might not uh might not pan out (laughs) yeah it's tough enough for some people just to get sex and now you want people to try to master it but um exactly (laughs) but it is well worth it it is well worth it i'm sure um you brought up porn and I did have an interesting takeaway from your book, learning about this study of super normal stimuli and how it's affected birds and animals. And this kind of, you made a connection to porn and how it might be affecting us, but can you tell the people a little bit about that study? Because I thought that was an interesting angle on the way we could maybe think about porn. Well, you know, I, I, I don't even, I don't have the, the specific study in front of me right now. And of course, when you're writing a book, you have all this stuff in front of you for easy <laughs> reference. And then, right. uh, so, you know, forgive me if I, if I miss any details at all. But, um, in general, you know, super normal stimuli are things that you won't ordinarily come across in the course of your life, but represent exaggerated versions of the things that excite you. Mm-hmm. Um, so examples that were given were sort of, um, you know, they figured out that, that I think it's like beak size and things in, in seagulls that are uh, particularly attractive. So they made these fake seagulls with these really colorful and bright beaks. And uh, men would, or, or male seagulls would shun actual females in favor of these dummies because mm-hmm. they had uh, the fake parts. Um, this was, there, were, there were numerous examples of this that I think I cited in the book. Mm-hmm. But overall, the idea is, is that the more you program your brain to react to these super normal stimuli, the less they're going to react to normal stimuli. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's always been pornography. You, you know, but it's never been the case that, you know, you, could, I mean, while sitting writing the book, it would take me less than two seconds if I wanted to watch some kind of pornography. Right. You know, you wouldn't have to go to extraordinary lengths anymore. It's just blink. It's there any kind that you can possibly imagine. Mm-hmm. And of course, what people report is that 
tastes get more and more extreme. So they start watching a little bit of pornography and then that doesn't do it anymore. So they need something stronger and they need something, you know, this is how sort of extreme tastes develop. And there's nothing wrong with extreme tastes. I think, you know, I mean, I, I'm, as far as it, I'm concerned, if it's safe and consensual and, and, uh, involves adults, um, <laughs> the, willing adults, then, then it's good. It's fine. Right. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is that surgically enhanced people that are submitting to whatever kind of fetish you can imagine for money are probably not the person that you're dating or married to. <laughs> right, right. You know, even those people, you know, they're doing it for for money, for your entertainment. They're probably not only doing that in their bedroom. So in turn, you can lose more and more interest in actual people. And this is harmful. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think this is a good thing for for society. But that said, moderation is the key, not ditching things. I did not write that because I am against porn or anti-porn. I didn't suddenly become prudes, be prudish because <laughs> I have children. It's just simply a fact that just like food or drinking or anything else, we need to monitor our intake, see what is actually enjoyable and what is actually harming us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Um, so let's dive into it a little bit. If somebody is interested in doing this or trying this out, where would someone start? Or where would, I guess, a couple start with this? Well, um, you know, they, first of all, they could grab my book. Um, <laughs> and the first thing that you would want to do is master, uh, not master, but gain competency. And this is, this, this difference between mastery and competency is, is key to one of the great keys of life, quite frankly. <laughs> but you want to gain competency in the vase breathing technique, in the inner fire technique, and everything that, you know, that I laid out in the beginning, because that is going to help you regulate your energy. It's going to help you regulate your excitement. And in the case of, uh, uh, well, both men and women, it's going to help you reverse the flow of energy and in the case of men, the, the, the flow of fluid during the sex magical act. So, you know, that would be the key is to get working on that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Also, meditation is key. I say this about everything. Uh, it, it is... It is this one huge aspect that, that just makes everything in every aspect of life better. And in this case, it's very important because through sex magic and through the inner fire technique, you are going to be turning the volume up on the energies of the body and the mind. This doesn't mean just the good stuff. This is also the bad stuff. This is why, you know, they have people do a hundred thousand prostrations or, or go through, uh, Lam Rim or something like that. Some kind of training or, or, or purification practice, uh, before engaging in tantric practice like this. So in this case, meditation is key because you want to be able to recognize thought patterns when you're distracted, when you're obsessed, and be able to instantly disengage in those. And that, that only comes with practice. So I would say the place to start is the key practices towards the beginning. Mm -hmm. Then after that, when you get into the sex practices, you can decide what you're interested in. There's, there's a whole host of practices in there. There are practices where you're invoking gods and spirits into yourself and then uniting sexually as those uh, gods. So for instance, you know, a female can invoke Aphrodite, a male can invoke Aries and, and unite them both uh, in the course of a ritual as a devotional act or as a magical act. Then there are rituals in there for the creation of spirits. There's 
rituals in there for um, for creating the elixir for for creating the um, yeah, well, the elixir that is made from the combined sexual fluid, the Amrita uh, in the East, it would be called. But the idea that the magically charged fluid of the male and female combined uh, is a powerful medicine is an old one that seems to uh, appear in many places throughout history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a a real great time reading through all the vast possibilities. And one thing I thought was pretty interesting was your idea for body painting sigils. Because I'm kind of into the sigil magic thing. Actually, to be honest with you, I still have uh, a sigil from your financial sorcery book taped up on my monitor. It's been there for, I don't know, two plus years. Um, I haven't really done much with it, but look at it occasionally. But I thought that was a pretty interesting idea because the sigil magic thing kind of resonates with me and body painting would be uh, taking it to a new level. Well, you know, this is this is one of those things that I developed, uh, you know, during my teenage years. <laughs> um, I, I, of course, like many other people, read uh, Modern Magic, where they talk about the technique of, of looking at a sigil at the moment of orgasm. And then when I got into the chaos magic stuff, I really opened up my practice, where, again, you're, you're doing the sigil, you're posting it up somewhere, and you're looking at it at the moment of orgasm. But most people were doing this is like, you know, they would put this up on an altar and then have to remember to look at it, you know, when they're about to, uh, about to explode. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my thought was, well, why would I want it on an altar or even on, you know, why wouldn't I want it on my partner so that I could absorb myself into the person that I'm, I'm having sex with. Uh, so this is a technique that I, I had developed, you know, pretty early on before, before I was drinking age, where you would put the, the sigil not only on the, your and your partner's forehead, uh, but backside, chest, you know, wherever you might be looking, wherever, whenever you're doing whatever you're doing, uh, there should be a sigil there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a really creative way of updating some um, magical ideas. But um, what can you tell us about invocation and sex? Well, you know, I mean, the the invocation and in, in sex, as in the calling down of, of a deity into yourself, and then having sex because. The moment of orgasm is, again, not to keep beating this dead horse, but is this ego-shattering moment, right? Mm -hmm. It is what in, in the East they call a completion stage practice. So imagine this. You're doing your invocation. You, you visualize your astral body as, say, I don't know, pick a deity or, or, or spirit, you know. You, you, you imagine your astral body or, or whatever to be Cthulhu. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so then you are, so you have formed the habitat and then perhaps you have decorated the temple to create a habitat with elder signs or, or whatever kind of <laughs> uh, stuff you're doing. Obviously, I'm, I'm not advocating Cthulhu. So, uh, you know, using a planetary uh, association, let's do Mars. You are perhaps wearing some kind of red robe and the, the room that maybe has red light bulbs and you've got a, a big old star on the ground, a five-pointed star and you know, you're, you're calling upon, um, Aries. Then you do your prayer. You, you, oh, Aries, you know, big old God of war, <laughs> uh, you know, come on down and, and, uh, you know, enter me and share your, your wisdom and wrath and all that kind of jazz. All this is what in the Eastern terms would be generation stage. 
In other words, it's all stuff that is contrived by the mind to achieve something, right? Mm -hmm. So then you, you open it up. Now, in a normal invocation, this is where all that there is to the completion stage is that you, you open it up and you become receptive. Mm -hmm. Okay? So this would be the completion stage. And uh, this exists in Tantra, too. But if we're to do something more, there are practices that are completion stage. And sex yoga is one of these practices that is completion stage. So if you are Aries now, so now you are, Aries is riding you. It's probably not full possession, as in you don't know where you are, and Aries is stomping around your house <laughs> and looking for a sword or some shit like that. Um, but you are sharing consciousness with Aries, or, uh, you know, you have this, sense of martial energy entering you or, you know, whatever degree. And in, in my strategic sorcery course, I talk about the different degrees that there are. It's not really a matter of something happens, something doesn't happen. It's a matter of happening in, in degree. Mm -hmm. So then you engage in the sex magic practice. And now you have, you know, you build this inner fire. You, inner fire is a sublimation practice alchemically. You are making something literally more subtle. Mm -hmm. So you are taking your, your etheric body and your astral body and to a certain extent your physical body and you are refining it. You are burning away the physical dross. This allows that spiritual essence to take a greater presence, greater hold. Thus, it is a completion stage practice. You don't need to contrive it with the mind. You don't need to talk about it. You do it. Mm -hmm. And it happens whether you believe in it or not. You don't need to believe in the process any more than you believe in starting your car. It happens because it happens. Then the sex magic aspect of it, you have, you bring, you know, you, you reach this moment of orgasm and that's the, that's the key moment. The ego shatters and what is waiting to be filled fills you up. Wow. And so now you've gotten out of your own way. <laughs> you've blown apart your ego momentarily and what are, what instantly re-arises is this presence of Aries or Cthulhu or whatever. <laughs> and then, then your own ego will naturally assert itself because, you know, you're still attached to this body. Right, right. So, yeah. So that's sort of why sex is so powerful a method for invocation. It is a completion stage practice rather than just leaving the completion stage open to, okay, now be here. <laughs> yeah, man, that sounds pretty wild. Yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of people put on airs about how they're, you know, oh, I was, you know, ridden, and maybe some people are telling the truth about being fully possessed, and, and certainly I've seen possession uh, happen in group ceremonies. But a lot of people are faking it till they make it, too. <laughs> I get that. It sounds good to me. Of course, I've never experienced anything like that, but it sounds like it would work. Have you had any uh, some pretty intense experiences with invocation using the sex magic? Oh goodness, yes. Some of <laughs> some of the most powerful uh, experiences of my life have been been brought about by this. Uh, um, you know, but I I try not to discuss them too much. I get that. Be yeah. Because, you know, it's, they're, in, they're important to me 
and they because they really happen to me. But once you start reporting them to other people, then it's really just about look how awesome I am. I did this. I mm-hmm. you know had this. Into, I felt you know I saw myself flying and and could actually see into people's houses and you know Aries himself entered me and you know whatever whatever it is. And amazing things can happen. Mm-hmm. The most amazing thing by far is the natural clarity that can arise from operations like these. But by talking about it, it doesn't really benefit anyone because the specifics are never going to be repeated. Right. I get that. It, 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 it's all sort of just, look at how awesome I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it, these things a lot of times are personal experiences. But what can you tell us about cycling energy? This sounds like a pretty high-level sexual experience, I have to say. That was probably the most interesting to me. Well, you know, the, the cycling of energy between people is... I guess you could call it a high level practice, but I try not to think of things that way. I try instead to think of things as here's how you do it. And once you get the basics down enough to do it, then you give it a try. And at first you're not going to be excellent at it. And then later you'll be excellent. You'll be excellent at it or you'll be competent at it and gain results. But then people, obviously, who spend years and years doing it get amazing, amazing results, just like martial arts. You know, you can get wonderful, wonderful benefit from going to Kung Fu three nights a week for 10 years. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're going to be a heck of a, a, of a fighter and, and, and gain some wonderful health benefits from Kung Fu, but you're not going to be a Shaolin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Um, so we have to recognize the role of confidence, mastery, and perfection, uh, and what we're in, what we're actually seeking. So the energy practices are, are basically this. It, 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 it is the idea that we can unite with someone, you know, if it's a male and female pairing or people that are running the male female polarity, which same sex couples have, have said that they can do. And I have no reason to, to doubt that. Mm-hmm. Um, then you are, you are creating something greater than what you can do within your own self. You are benefiting from someone else's energy that complements your own. And, Hopefully, they are benefiting from yours and that you both uh, grow and create something through this experience. So, the cycling of energy is simply a way to, to take what is already happening and make it better, stronger, more conscious. So, for instance, there are, you know, in the book I talk about just moving energy and, and Tigles out your mouth into the mouth of your partner, down through their central channel, out through their, uh, through their, you know, sexual organs into yours and keep this spiral flowing. Mm-hmm. Um, then there are certain mantric practices where you see this happening, where you're actually saying a mantra internally and, and there are very specific energies that are circulated this way so that it gains the strength of everyone's you know, of, of the worlds within worlds that exist within us and, uh, you know, create something magnificent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really thought that was pretty interesting, the idea of a secular loop of euphoria between sexual partners and building that energy, because the idea of invoking entities is very interesting, but I think most people, if they were to look into sex magic, it would be more about increasing pleasure between the two partners rather than it would be bringing in some uh, ethereal third party. (laughs) Yeah, well, you know, I mean, the great benefit of of most of these practices is that they do result in increased pleasure and and so on. I I almost want to have a a second, uh, you know, subtitle for the book, you know, like, uh, you know, Sex, sorcery, and spirit ribbed for her pleasure. <laughs> but, <laughs> written for her pleasure. Um, you know, so it's, uh, 
you do have this ways to in- increase the euphoria. Again, it's all about taking the, the act that is already pretty damn awesome and making it even more awesome, making it go deeper, more intense, and longer. Mm-hmm. And it seems like to do that, the, the two introductory things uh, that most males need to do is the breathing. You know, the breathing becomes a huge part of it. And then the fluid retention. Would you say those are the gateways to some of these higher forms of it? They are. They are. Now, the fluid retention thing is something a lot of people get really, really into this. So you get people that are into the Taoist uh, stuff, and they they will and also in tantric you know there are some tantras that uh, one of the vows is to never again drop your seed yikes and you have you know you have Taoists that that uh, including some westerners that are just sort of you know studying on their own that take these vows to just retain semen and never ever let the fluid drop mm-hmm. they report amazing health benefits from it. Some people do not. Um, (laughs) Whatever, you know, I I will let the science hash itself out on that. Um, What I can say is that it's it's not like a Montauk Chia thing in my book where you must never, ever do this again. It's about being able to control it. It's about if you're going to let the fluid go, then you should be able to control when. Mm-hmm. Or you should be able to have an orgasm and not let it go. And, and to be able to then keep having sex after this intense, magnificent experience. You know, this is why we do what we do with the, with the semen retention, not as sort of a, a long time vow. Mm-hmm. But many people do take this long time vow. And I guess the way people get started with it is pretty self-explanatory. You just block it off. You know, you talk about the term locking, which is basically just holding the chamber so it's not going to come out. That seems painful. (laughs) It's not, though. It's not painful. (laughs) That's interesting. You know, it's not painful. The next time you're, you're having sex, you know, you can put your fingers down there. Do the three finger lock and see for yourself. It's, it's not painful. That said, there's more to it than just the withholding of the fluid. You want to be able to use, you know, it's not just that one lock. There are three locks. There's the lock, uh, the, the throat lock, which forces the upward flowing prana downward. And then the, the root lock, which not only blocks the fluid, but sends it upward. So you want to master those. But seriously, you know, the next time you're having sex, if you're, or, or for that matter, given the old Pamela Henderson <laughs> to yourself, you can, you can reach down and uh, just put pressure on the perineum and then hold your breath and, and then withdraw, follow the lock system and it will withdraw the fluid back into the bladder, but the energy will flow up into the brain. You'll, you'll feel it. It's, it's almost, you can't not. <laughs> That's so interesting. So it's a, it's a, an orgasm still occurs, but it basically sends the energy to different parts of your body. Exactly, exactly. Man. Um, very easy to practice with someone giving you oral because they're already down there and they can reach up and do the job themselves. Easy if you're doing it yourself. Uh, if you're actually having like missionary position sex or, or doggy style, then it becomes a, you know, a more difficult thing to reach down with your hand and block it, which is why you should practice the, uh, the perineum lock. Your you know flex the perineum muscle. Mm-hmm. And when you do this successfully, you don't have the same feelings of exhaustion. You're able to continue. Usually, you're able to continue. Maybe not at first, not your first few times. Right, it's a practice. But after a while, yes, you'll you'll be able to have this experience. You know, you, I'm not saying you're gonna like keep going full force. You 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 back it down. Right, you back it down a notch. You, you know. <laughs> Use the slow hand, you you know, and mm-hmm. then you you build it back up, and you you head at it again. Man, I just I never really considered kinking that hose, but I guess it's worth a shot. 
Well, don't, don't actually kink the hose. That's, that's, <laughs> that's an emergency room visit. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Not, not quite so literally. Um, it is about that time. I had an awesome time. I've learned a lot. I really enjoyed your book. I thought it was super interesting and a lot of fun. And before we really get out of here, would you like to remind the people about your website, where to get the book and some other things you got going on? Well, the book uh, is available through Amazon and is available through Barnes and Noble and is available. The best place to get it is, of course, your local independent bookseller. If you have one, your local independent occult store, if you have one, those places desperately need your support. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's available through any kind of major bookseller. Um, my books that are, are done with new page, I do not sell myself. So I am the one place you can't get it. Um, <laughs> unless you happen to be at a, a teaching that I'm physically at and then I physically have copies that I can sell, um, which happens every now and then. But uh, in general, you want to get it from your local bookseller. As for me, you can find me at strategicsorcery.net. Um or just Google strategic sorcery and you'll find the, the blog I keep and all the other things going on. And of course the strategic sorcery course, which is sort of the gateway into my community, my, my system of doing things. Um, it's a one year course that costs $150 and it's 52 lessons of just hardcore practical magic. <laughs> right on. Well, we did cover a lot of ground, a lot of interesting topics. Do you have any final thoughts to leave the people with on the subject of sex magic? No, just uh, practice safe, sane, consensual, and, and enthusiastic and fun uh, sex. Don't let the, techno the technical aspects withdraw from the passion. Uh, there's a lot of even sex magic writers out there that talk about passionless sex that, you know, you need to be focused on the goal. This, that's bold dinky. Mm. Uh, the passion needs to be there for it to work. So, uh, master the tech, but don't let it extinguish the flame of passion. Well said. An awesome thing to leave on Jason. Thanks again. Had a great time. Keep doing what you do out there and take care of yourself. All right, man. Thanks for having me. You got it. There we have it, folks. Jason Miller and the taboo topic that is sex magic. <laughs> I hope it was interesting for you. I think there's definitely meat on those bones. Lots of stuff I hadn't heard before just in the first hour. Getting that internal heat going. Cycling that energy. Doing your breathing exercises. Getting those locks in place. And from there in the Plus Show, we talked about some of the more far-out stuff. Like erotic comatose lucidity. That's a trippy one the earthenware virgin technique and other ideas and rituals for creating your own homunculus or spiritual entity out of the sexual fluids. We talked about Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard's personal attempts to create a moonchild homunculus. We talked about some possible connections between cryptids and magic or spirits. The Vajroli Mudra, which is odd, creating a Suction effect with the penis. The yogis of India have demonstrated this ability in a lot of ways. One being sucking up fuel and shooting it into a fire. That's one thing they do. I mean, they don't have cable over there, people. So what do you want? <laughs> we also discussed the sixth Dalai Lama, who was not keen on the celibacy thing. And we got into Crowley's adventures into sexual alchemy and a couple other cool things. So check that out and support the show at the same time. I'm glad we could do it. I think sex magic, like any form is a tool and interesting to get a sense of what types of energies and effects can be achieved through sexual rituals. Obviously, we hear a lot of rumors about the shadowy elite partaking in sexual rituals of a darker tone. And of course, that's not what this was about, but getting a little knowledge on this stuff on a 101 level, I think, helps us to get a better understanding of some of those rumors, perhaps. Maybe gives us a little bit of discernment when hearing some of those wilder stories. And maybe it just gives you a great opportunity to bring stuff like this up to your partner without being creepy, you know? It's not like you were out there looking this stuff up on the internet. It just happened to come up on a podcast you like, and it got you thinking. <laughs> bada bing, bada boom. I don't have to have the whole conversation for you, but I hope that you do have a great Valentine's Day. And you take the opportunity to make your partner feel good. And if you're single, well, take the opportunity to do something that makes you a more appealing partner when someone does come around. 
We can all make those improvements. And I myself, I got to get out of here. I got a dinner to make for that little special somebody in my own life. So take care. And I will see you in just a few days with a cryptozoology show that I think is pretty fun and a little bit different with a great guest you might have heard of on Coast to Coast by the name of J.C. Johnson. And to play us out today is a very special treat. Nick Tetralt has altered the words to a classic song and made it about THC, which is great. So if anyone else can make a THC-themed cover song and tweak it in a similar way, I would be so happy. I will definitely give you a shout-out. So please send me any of those if you can at thehiresidechats at gmail.com. I'll also include a link to more of Nick's stuff with this episode. And that said, I I guess I'm out of here. So sweet dreams, lovers. Sweet dreams to the elite We're calling them out on THC Uncovering secrets and conspiracies Everybody's looking for something Some of them want to use you Some of them want to get used by you Some of them want to abuse you Some of them want to be abused Sweet themes on THC Who the hell could disagree? We know the rabbit hole goes deep Everybody's dead Some of them want to get used by